Good day to everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of this joint IMF uh, talk conference. COVID-19 has disrupted economies and societies on a scale never witnessed before. And just when we think we get into the end of it, there are new variants, further disruption, and yet more challenges. To protect lives and livelihoods and ensure business continuity, governments have implemented a plethora, plethora of relief measures resulting in increased borrowing to unprecedented levels. The pandemic has been a catalyst in driving digitalization in government, presenting new challenges as well as opportunities. Yesterday's conference focus was on policy aspects. Today, we will focus on tax administration and lessons that have been learned during the pandemic. As countries started to take action to curb the spread of the virus in March 2020, so we saw an increase in employees working from home, including staff from revenue administrations. This raised new challenges for many tax administrations, such as how do staff access IT systems remotely and securely, retain service levels to taxpayers at consistently higher levels, and continue to collect taxes, especially as a global shutdown coincided with peak filing seasons in many countries. Normal operations were impacted and administrations were not able to carry out business as usual in all areas. For example, it was just not feasible to carry out physical audits at the pre premises of taxpayers. In addition, many administrations were asked to undertake new roles providing assistance, including financial assistance to taxpayers on behalf of the wider government. It also became quickly evident that digitalization of tax administrations was of great assistance in dealing with, the, with a crisis such as COVID-19. We have seen in our work at the IMF that many administrations that had not yet implemented electronic filing or payment services quickly did so as the pandemic progressed. Turning back to our program today, I am delighted to advise that we have three three sessions and we have a great mix between practitioners, heads of administration and academics. Session one, the plenary lecture by the Commissioner of the South African Revenue Service, Mr. Edward Kieswetter, on tax administration and the pandemic, the South African experience, followed by three further speakers to be introduced by the session one chair, Professor Kotsayanos. Session two, the plenary lecture is by the Deputy Director General of the Estonian Tax and Customs Board, Mr. Rivo Reitman, on digitalization and tax administration in Estonia, followed by two further speakers to be introduced by the session two chair, Professor Hesse Mazade. And finally, session three, the plenary lecture is by the Director General of Taxes in Cameroon, Mr. Modest Moper on opportunities and challenges from a Cameroonian perspective, followed by a panel discussion facilitated by Deborah Adams of the IMF, including all plenary speakers to be introduced by the session three chair, Matthew Rablin. Thank you and enjoy the day. Over to you, Christos. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian, for setting the scene. Uh, in what promises to be an exciting day with uh, you know, presentations from policymakers and academics working on topical uh, tax administration issues, you know, try to address some of the challenges you described. Uh, I'm really delighted now to introduce uh, our first speaker of the day, uh, Mr. Edward uh, you know, Kiswater, who will deliver a plenary lecture. Uh, Mr. Kiswater is the Commissioner of the South African Revenue Services. Uh, and if I may say so, has an impressive curriculum vita uh, having worked in both for the public and the private sector, but at the same time, he has been engaging actively with the academic world as a visiting professor in a number of universities. Um, Mr. Kiswata, it's a pleasure to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, what is really central to my message is that at the before the pandemic, uh, SARS had come through quite a significant um, change in direction, um, as I will soon point out, and had to re-clarify its journey 
um, and that inadvertently positioned us to deal with the pandemic. And I think the lesson there is where one has strategic clarity, you're able to respond to discontinuities or disruptions such as the pandemic had proven to be. So very quickly, and some of you may be aware of this because it was widely reported, that between 2014 uh, and about 2018, SARS had been, really had become caught in the project of state capture. It was deliberately weakened under a leadership with a corrupt intent. The president appointed a commission of inquiry led by Judge Nugent. And this inquiry led to the dismissal of the former commissioner and the appointment of myself on the 1st of May, 2019. But just to give you a flavor, since 2014, there was a massive failure uh, and deliberately so of governance and integrity. There was an operating model review, which sadly was uh, meant to weaken the organization and to render it incapable of serving its mandate. And this led to a decline in revenue performance, a decline in tax morale and compliance, a decline in employee morale and confidence in the leadership, as well as a decline in hard-won public confidence in SARS. Um, I think also noteworthy is that there was a significant loss of skills, but also the culture had changed. Um, it was very bureaucratic, head office centric. Many decisions were elevated to the level of head office or the commissioner's office, um, and the organization was left too dependent on head office and the multi-level of leadership's uh, levels just made it almost impossible and inefficient to get anything done. There was a disconnect between management and the front line, a culture of fear and intimidation and the employees really uh, felt that they could no longer have any trust and the culture was palpably uh, negative and bad. On the harder side, we had lost a number of staff and you can see there in very technical areas um, that we needed, we were no, no longer able to recruit staff and almost 3000 staff left during that period, a period that was characterized by the soul of the organization being weakened and trust being eroded. Thankfully, the rebuilding of SARS had commenced and a smart and modern revenue authority that is admired and trusted is central to the rebuilding of SARS. We started with strategic clarity. And this is very important that we tell the same story clearly with simplicity and consistency. This cannot be overstated because this is what enables staff to manage through disruptions, through discontinuities, and when things don't go according to plan, this is the compass that keeps one going true north, even though you have to make up tactically what needs to be done at the time, the strategic direction does not shift. And the strategic clarity is important because it answers important questions for us. What is our mandate or what do we do? Whether we have a higher reason for existing other than administering laws, and we have clearly defined one for ourselves, our vision, what it is we want to achieve, and how we will approach our work or our strategic intent. And it is that clarity of those four aspects of mandate, purpose, vision, and strategic intent that then informs everything that we do, um, how we allocate resources ultimately, and how we define success. Our mandate, as you would know, is cast in law, um, and that is to collect all revenues that are due, and in the case of SARS, that includes customs duties, to improve and ensure optimal compliance of all legislations that are applicable, and ultimately also from the customs perspective, to facilitate legitimate trade um, and, and provide border protection in order to enhance the integrity of our domestic economy. That's what we do. But why we do it is important. And this is what really is the inspiration that 
every SARS employee draws on, that our work is transformative and enables government to foster and to nurture sustainable economic growth um, and ultimately underpins the social development that serves the well-being of all South Africans. And this is very important. We remind ourselves of this every day and we build it in everything that we do. It is not just um, a, a poster on the wall, but it becomes the essence uh, or our DNA as such. Our vision, we wanted to be clear that we did not simply want to restore the SARS pre-2014 because time has moved on and to just restore SARS would in fact be standing still or going backwards. So we envisaged a smart modern SARS, but one that has unquestionable integrity that can be trusted and admired. Our strategic intent was to develop a tax and custom system based on voluntary compliance. This follows an international best practice but also underscores the, the knowledge that no revenue authority will ever have enough resources to enforce compliance. So what is required is to build a system of compliance that is virtuous and that engenders or invokes within each uh, of the taxpayers the, the momentum uh, if not the desire to comply and whilst presenting a credible threat of detection for those who willfully choose not to comply. Our model of compliance is, is simply, uh, again, following best practices that most taxpayers are honest and they are at the bottom of the, of the pyramid. And for those who are honest and willing to comply, we must make it easy for them uh, for those who need help, let's help them. For those who choose either negligently or willfully or even criminally not to comply progressively, we must enforce the law. We then translated our strategic intent of voluntary compliance into nine clear objectives. And they are simple to understand, but it is in their simplicity that they are profound and provide clarity and direction, and in fact tells the story of SARS. The first three being the core business objectives, which is to provide certainty and clarity to make it easy for willing taxpayers, which in our theory, that applies to most taxpayers. And whilst the third objective is to present a credible, th uh, credible threat, um, and to be able to respond to instances of non-compliance. Increasingly, we cannot do those three things if we do not ensure we develop our staff and we have an aging staff and we know that it's not just about um, replacing skilled staff, it's also about evolving the workforce to be more future oriented, given the world where we're working towards in a fourth industrial revolution, increasingly where human effort is either um, substituted by automation or augmented by artificial intelligence. So five and six is really about using data and technology. Um, strategic objective seven is just being, creating a mindfulness of resource stewardship because we'll always have too little money uh, and therefore performance excellence and efficiency is an explicit objective for us. And eight and nine uh, simply underscores that we are part of an ecosystem and, uh, and, and that we depend on intermediary service providers and other uh, representatives who help to improve and strengthen the system. That's just a picture that translates our compliance model into more of a, a business model. On the left-hand side, very clear segmentation, and on the right-hand side, the outcomes that the work we do must produce. This slide brings together our higher purpose and our mandate um, and links it to what we call our means, which is managing the value chain of registration through to account reconciliation and our strategic intent, which is how we administer using a platform of voluntary compliance 
uh, expressed through the nine objectives. And if we do that well, we will fulfill our mandate um, as it is there. And so we talk about our means end uh, as part of our internal narrative when we tell the story of SARS. And expressing it like this makes it easy to communicate various aspects of our work and it helps to also drive various strategic or tactical or operational aspects of the business. And it allows our staff to have a common narrative uh, when we tell the story, the, the story of SARS. This is just how we think about revenue. And you can see there every year, the minister um, provides us with an estimate. Um, and that's generally a function of the assumptions of economic activities um, and tax policy instruments that produces a theoretical number. But the actual revenue that is collected, as you all know, is not a function of theoretical assumptions and tax policy instruments. That's only true if you have 100% compliance. In reality, when compliance is low, you need an effective administration, uh, an, an administration that is characterized by institutional integrity with a clear compliance program and that has the requisite capability and capacity. Um, and we, we have introduced a language of revenue collection as opposed to revenue that we receive. And then on the right-hand side, uh, very important is the compliance culture. And there it is confidence in government as well as SARS. It is whether citizens have a sense that they are getting a benefit for the money that they give um, and ultimately the levels of compliance that will. So we say those three bubbles work together to produce the final revenue that we collect. And our work is about essentially the administration bubble and secondly, how we can influence the culture of compliance in society. Um, and our approach can either at, uh, attribute or attract uh, um, the culture or it can detract from it. This is just to give you a sense that during COVID, um, in the worst possible prediction round about October, we had, the minister had forecasted a underperformance of 300 uh, billion rand of, uh, uh, of underperformance against the, uh, the estimate uh, that he set for us at February last year. Remember COVID hit South Africa on the, first of, on the 5th of March. Uh, in October, he, he adjusted the revenue estimate 300 down. We ended the year uh, collecting over $170 billion, more than the worst uh, performance. And in fact, achieved uh, the February estimate um, by over 38 billion. That just gives you a sense uh, of our total revenue collections and refunds and the final revenue uh, that ended up in the National Revenue Fund. And at the bottom, you have a sense of, of how that is broken down by various tax types. Important though, is this next slide, that we have begun to measure very explicitly the revenue that we track from our compliance program, our compliance activity. And I leave that there just for a minute so that uh, people can see. Um, we explicitly manage debt collection. Uh, we explicitly uh, manage investigative and, and other uh, uh, enforcement work that we do. Um, you can see uh, just an extraordinary focus on outstanding returns, added another 5.4 billion. Um, customs and excise focus added another 23 billion. And so each of these areas of work, we track the revenue very, very directly. Our voluntary disclosure program produced almost 5 billion. Um, and so you can see uh, let me move to the bottom of that slide where we talk about refund leakage protection. Sadly, we have found an increasing attack on our refund system to have fraudulent 
uh, access to refund. And so using um, machine learning algorithms, data, technology, data and technology, we were able to build a refund risk detection um, and that uh, allowed us to prevent uh, 45 billion of refunds from being paid out unnecessarily. Um, and also in total, therefore contributed to the 172 billion that we collected. So what we're basically saying is if SARS had not done any of the work and just depended on taxpayers um, to pay in their provisional uh, and assessed revenue, then we would have been short 172 billion. And we focus on this every year. Then along came COVID. And as I said, the big lesson for us here is that our inadvertently, our clarity of our intent actually just allowed us to step up and accelerate the work of modernization. We didn't have to change course. We didn't have to do different things. We just had to do the things we had planned a lot faster. And it was about leveraging people, data, and technology. Um, and, and we had to very quickly redefine the way we work. In the first lockdown, which was a hard lockdown, we had to do our entire revenue year in uh, basically with only a handful of staff uh, entirely virtually. Um, and in the first 100 days, we had to step up our level of enabling our employees from about 12% uh, uh, to almost 90% that are able to work from home. Obviously, we now are working towards a new normal but effectively, all of our contact center staff are enabled to work from home. All of our frontline staff are enabled to work from home, but we work on a hybrid model where some of them work from home and some of them are in the office because we still have taxpayers that come into the office. But there you can see our hybrid working uh, relationship. We introduced appointments, uh, rotational schedules for our staff, because we had to balance the risk of, of transmission of the virus, both for our employees as well as for our staff. We had to balance, uh, sorry, our employees as well as taxpayers. Uh, we had to introduce social distancing, reconfigure some of our workplaces, uh, queue management had to change. So basically our entire day-to-day -day operational interfaces uh, between staff, the way we configured them and taxpayers, we had to shift. Um, in the first 100 days, we added 45 additional uh, technology and data functionalities, uh, where effectively you can now do almost everything that we, we had planned over the next three years to introduce more digitally. Uh, you can see the, uh, a list of additional features just within the, uh, the first 100 days, and we continue to do that. The effect thereof was that we removed about 6 million taxpayer interactions, which ordinarily would have been interactions within an office between a SARS employee and a taxpayer that has been converted uh, to a digital uh, offering. Um, and we also chose three and three, almost three and a half million taxpayers uh, for whom we have implemented an auto assessment. And what an auto assessment <coughs> basically is, is uh, it is trying to make filing a non-event for standard income earners, where we use third party data um, and, and uh, algorithms to provide the assessment outcome. Um, and a taxpayer literally can download it on our, app, on our digital app if they agree with the outcome, they literally accept it. And this takes between three and five minutes. And should they accept it, they would get an assessment in under five seconds. And if they had a refund that was due, their refund would be paid into the account in under 72 hours. Uh, that, that was our, our, our um, really the, the work of alter assessment that we were able to step up. And so doing all of this, minimize the interface 
and the reason for taxpayers to come into our office. And as I said, we had to enable 90% uh, of our staff to work remotely. So all of this was heading into uh, the first few months of COVID, and we have continued to build on this. Uh, tax filing season looks very different now. Uh, so just over three and a half, uh, 3.7 million tax returns have been received. 94% uh, of them will have come through a digital channel. Um, 242 would have been assisted um, and converted uh, while being assisted. Um, and we only have had 6% of taxpayers who actually visited our branches. And generally these are blue collar workers, workers who have either no access to technology or just don't have the wherewithal. That's the next big focus for us. Um, and you can see there that 93% um, of taxpayers that is, uh, experience a response time in under five seconds and 93% uh, of taxpayers would have received their refunds in under 72 hours. Uh, and this was also a huge benefit because it means that almost 14 billion have gone back to taxpayers in the form of refunds. Um, and this is obviously hugely important during the uh, COVID period. Um, and so you can see that um, what COVID did for us was to just step up our focus and accelerate our modernization. Uh, and therefore it did not throw us, uh, uh, take us off course, uh, neither did it disrupt us. It simply allowed us to step up the work we had planned to do. That just gives you a sense um, of the volumetrics that we process. Um, almost 90% of individual taxpayers uh, will have received it, uh, the, the auto assessment. 100% uh, of our returns for VAT and customs are digital. Um, it gives you a sense there of the electronic payments we, we process. Uh, at the bottom of the page, there are 138 million uh, data records from taxpayers allows us to uh, do the auto assessment. Um, and, uh, and basically we have um, largely taken SARS online, uh, which both balances the health risk of COVID as well as the journey of modernization to present ourselves and our engagement model to taxpayers largely electronically. I think also suffice to say that we are being noticed and thankfully more for positive than for negative reasons, such has been the case. Um, there's, we are generally in news uh, weekly uh, and we are on Twitter quite regularly. I personally uh, am on Twitter. I respond to taxpayers personally when there are Twitter requests. And this just gives you a sense that uh, we are regularly in the media um, and, and we are being taken notice of. Beyond uh, um, where we are now, just to give you a quick view, uh, what we say is we're preparing for a post-pandemic new normal, which is enabled by a modern SARS where routine tasks are continuously being automated and human effort is augmented by insights from data and enabled by technology. Um, we want to move beyond software development, so we are building in-house our capability for data science and technology. Uh, and this is hard because these skills are hard to come by, but SARS effectively is a technology factory that happens to double in tax. Uh, we cannot uh, continue to work through the volumes and volumes of returns and data in manual ways. Um, so what we have done is we've taken every one of our nine objectives and we've expressed it as a user experience and this sets out the journey beyond where we are at the moment, beyond COVID towards a new normal. And increasingly, the synthesis of data, technology and human effort uh, will be uh, what defines our journey. But more importantly, I think we, as part of our vision and accelerated by COVID is we want to make filing a non-event. Because here's the reality, taxpayers don't want a relationship with SARS. 
they are obliged in law to fulfill various tax obligations. And these obligations compel them to engage with science, not because they want to, but because they have no choice. In reality, taxpayers would be happiest if they have never to call our offices or visit our offices or send us mail or tweet about us. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I can't wait to go and visit SARS. Therefore, we consider every form of contact via any channel for any reason as one too many. And to the extent that we have to have contact, we, want, we aspire that this contact is not created by our own internal inefficiency. And when unavoidable, engagement will be seamless, intuitive, and largely taxpayer administered. Some of you will remember the book uh, just more than a decade ago by Price and Jaffer, which says the best service is no service. And that's really the aspiration we set for ourselves. In conclusion, we value our relationship with the IMF, with TARC. It's in fact very implicit in the objective that we set for ourselves, objective number eight, which says we cannot do our work on our own we have to work with and through stakeholders to improve the entire system. And this specific relationship is effective and beneficial for us in that we put at the center of everything we do, the taxpayers whom we serve, um, and of course, government on whose behalf we collect revenue and the public uh, and our international peers are important stakeholders in this regard. Our, our vision is that the whole must be greater than the sum of the parts. And therefore you are all part of the ecosystem that we build, the super platform that we are busy building. Um, so let me conclude by playing out um, the video that uh, we created during COVID when we wanted to make sure that taxpayers in fact remained on site, did not use COVID as an excuse to drop their compliance or to minimize their revenue, but in fact, um, to keep a, a steady hand and to ensure that our mandate uh, did not miss a heartbeat. Um, understandably, uh, it was affected by the economic downturn, but we wouldn't want to compound that by either being inefficient or by allowing the environment to impact taxpayer behavior negatively. Uh, Shikhar, do you want to play the video? I'm addressing you All your years of paying tax, you still wonder, why does it matter? It is true that we are facing a great It matters now more than ever. It matters to those who are exposed to harm to keep us away from it. The ones that leave behind all that they love. Your tax matters to them. Those who spend endless hours standing on their feet to care for others. It matters to those who are always at the heart of any crisis and our future generations. It matters to those who put so much love into giving selflessly to each and every family living on the breadline. It matters to all of us. To all taxpayers, pay your fair share. Do it for your nation. Your tax matters. Thank you. So we chose hashtag your tax matters for two reasons. Firstly, that we are focusing to help you resolve your tax matters to make it easy for you to fulfill it. But secondly, to give a strong message that your tax matters because it transforms the lives of the people who are in the front line and people who are in need. We were able to administer um, also uh, about 17 of the relief measures that government introduced. Uh, and we had to obviously prepare a platform to do that whilst uh, not missing a heartbeat to fulfill our mandate. So all in all, I think uh, it's too soon for us to declare victory, but we are encouraged that the work we are doing is laying the foundation uh, for the vision that we set up for ourselves. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I look forward to ongoing engagement.